All right, so this is going to be note 15 from CS70. This one is about random variables, um, specifically about distribution and expectation. So some definitions. Um, these are gonna be loose definitions. We're really just gonna look at an example that we're going to use throughout this note. So first off, um, what are the number of total outcomes for n coin tosses? Um, it's just two to the n. And then the probability of any one outcome is, you, you know, it's equally likely. That's just some refresher. But we're going to define this event. I'm going to call it x. And we're going to say that x is the number of heads that we obtain in our outcome. And notice how this is not the same across all outcomes. Um, so for example, if we say that the number of heads we obtain in our outcome, say that number is 0. In this case, there is only one possible outcome that has zero heads, and that probability is 1 16th. If we decide to look at the at um, the number of heads in our outcome and set that equal to 1, there's four possibilities of our set of n coin tosses having just one head in them. So notice how the probability is like distributed. It's not it's not a fixed value. Like for example, if we said um, what is the if if the number is three, the number of heads that we get such that the value is three. Sorry, why can't I let me say that in a better way? Heads we obtain is in our outcome. Yeah, so what is the probability that we obtain three heads in our outcome, essentially? that would be like a fixed value, right? But because we're saying that, what is the probability probability of any arbitrary number of heads? You know, there's a distribution. And then there's another thing called the expectation of X, which is basically the typical number of heads given that we toss N coins. And as you can tell from here, the typical number of heads is two because there are a total of six sample points out of the entire 16 sample points that have two heads in their outcomes. Um, and that makes sense because, you know, if the head has a one half chance of showing up and we toss the coin four times, then it would make sense that we see heads twice. So that's why this one is the, um, has the highest probability of occurring. Okay, so now we're going to um, hone in on what random variables are, but really quickly, let's just kind of refresh ourselves on the fixed point example, because we're going to use that a bit later. So N students, each student has a piece of homework. They turn that homework in, GSIs shuffle that homework, and then they randomly distribute the homeworks back to the N students. And you know, the question is usually, what is the likelihood that a student receives their homework? If a student receives their homework, we're considering that a fixed point. Um, if we have think of it as like a list of like one, two, and three, and they turn in their homeworks, one, two, and three, and then we shuffle this list, and then maybe return two to one, and like one to two, and three to three. In this case, three and three, that was that fixed point because students three receives their, their homework. Um, I, we've gone over this, but again, there's n factorial possible permutations of e homework. Um, they're each equally likely if we're distributing um, evenly. And again, this is how we represent the actual number of the homework, and this is the permutation of that homework. And we're going to be let event x sub n represent the number of fixed points. So now, with this analogy, I guess not this analogy, but this example, we're going to look at random variables more closely. So a random variable x on some sample space, capital omega, is a function. It's really just a function that takes sample points from large omega and maps it out to numbers on the, in the um, real, real space. So yeah, like so. So to visualize, you know, we have a random variable x, we have our inputs, which are any point, any number of points in the sample space, and then they just map out to here. So 
as you can see in the the range of our vent x given the previous example which is the um, fixed points the homeworks for students let's say there's three students okay the number of possible fixed points we can have range between zero and three here are all the possible permutations remember it's n factorial so three factorial is six um, they haven't mapped all of them out, but as you can see, this sample point corresponds to three fixed points. Um, homework one gets passed back to student one, homework two gets passed back to student two, etc. And then this point corresponds to, uh, what is it, zero fixed points, because no homework gets passed back to the respective person. Okay, so now we're going to close in even further and we're going to start off by thinking about some important things when talking about random variables. So we want to know the set of values that we can take in. And then we want to, um, and when I mean take in, I mean like that, that we can choose for um, x. So basically all of these values in that example. And we also want to understand the probabilities with, we, with which each of those values take on. So we're going to scroll, and let me see my, yeah we're going to just talk about it a little bit more and we're going to look at an example up here so let me see if I if I just copy this open it in here and then I can like switch back and forth yeah okay let me see does that work yeah okay so we have this set notation right here. So this set right here is going to be all of the sample points in our sample space, such that the event maps it out to a specific A. So what that means in the con oh well, yeah. So what that means in the context of this problem is we want the set, for example, we want the set of all sample points such that let's say the value of x is one, number of heads is one. The, the set of all the sample points would be this set right here on this row right here. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So, um, yep, we looked at the example. A is any number in the range of x. All um, sample points in our sample space that give us A when inputted into x, that's what this set is right here. And this is an event. This is a specific event because where this is more where this is really a random variable if we just define it as um, the number of outcomes that have say two heads that is an event that is a fixed value whereas this random variable when it's any arbitrary number of heads in our outcome that is a um, that is not a fixed value that has a distribution you know, as indicated here. So hopefully the distinction between events and random variables is clear. Events are kind of made up of a bunch of random variables, or sorry, no, random variables are made up of a bunch of events. And sometimes those events are called indicator events, I believe. So yeah, we're gonna, get, we're gonna move on to that eventually. For now, we're also just gonna briefly talk about what distribution is and what it is is just the um, kind of how the probabilities uh, fall for each um, a in our space a if that makes sense I mean we'll, we'll get to a clear example in a bit but um, to define distribution the distribution of a discrete random variable x is the collection of values um, all of the a's that it can be where a is the set of all po possible values. So it's the, like, to look at our example again, um, here are all the possible a's for, you know, the, the four coin flip um, scenario. And here are all the probabilities. So, you know, probability of zero heads, 1 16th, probability of one head is 4 16th. Again, if you sum up all of these probabilities, they should total to one. Um, we can look at our fixed point example to get another um, view on this. So we're going to let 
x our random variable be the number of fixed points for a particular outcome. So we can have zero fixed points, one fixed point, and three fixed points. We can't have two fixed points uh, because if we have two fixed points, then the only spot left for the last value is to just go back to itself. Um, you can sort of see that for yourself. But um, just for example, zero fixed points, there's a one third chance of that because there, um, let's see, there are these two options right here um, out of the six total options. If we have, you know, three fixed points, there's only one option for that where every student gets back their own homework. And then just by this process of elimination, if it's only one fixed point, then there's three out of the six. So, yep, hopefully fairly straightforward. Um, let's look at some important properties for this. Okay, so any two events, x is equal to a1, x is equal to a2, a1 and a2 are disjoint. So for if some sample point contributes to the space of sample points that have zero fixed points, as is the case with this right here, then it's not possible for it to also have one fixed point. That's what this is saying in the context of this example. And let's see, the union of all of these events is equal to the entire sample space. Right, that makes sense. Now we're going to talk about different types of distributions. Okay, so um, we're not quite there yet. Bernoulli distribution. So, yes, our random variable can take on zero or one. And the probability of one is p, probability of zero is just one minus p, kind of like the coin flip scenario. So we would say x is distributed as a Bernoulli random variable with parameter p. That's kind of what this means. Okay, now this is a pretty useful distribution. It's called the binomial distribution. And we can model it using the biased coin flip example. So we're going to define the chance of obtaining head as p and omega lowercase omega is going to be a particular outcome just in our sample space and we're going to define this random variable x as the number of heads in the outcome so to give an example let's say we spin the dice or geez say we flip the biased coin three times and we want to know what is the uh, probability that we have obtain two heads? So there are three sample points that have two heads in them. We can calculate the probability of the sample point by simply multiplying the probability of the number of heads times the probability of the number of tails. And we can also just multiply that by the number of sample points there are in this space right here. So in this case, it would be three choose two, which is just three. And then, yes, basically the binom binomial distribution is as follows. Um, the probability of some event given some specific value is going to be n, the like as represented here, the number of coin tosses, choose i, which is the number of heads we're looking for, and then times the probability we decided on, and then, you know, for all of that. So if we were to sum all of the probabilities of each specific input to the random variable, then we would get one. As we demonstrated up here, you know, we sum all of these probabilities, we get one. Okay, and then just by replacing this with this, we get the same thing. Okay, now we're going to look at what this kind of looks like. So let's say that the chance of landing on heads is one half, and we're going to flip a coin nine times. What this is showing is, given that we flip the coin nine times, um, what are the probabilities that we see 
like four four heads or five heads or six heads like one through nine heads right and it makes sense that the number the highest number of heads that we would see would be four or five because again if there's a 50 percent chance of seeing heads then given that we flip the coin nine times we're going to see about half of those coins land on heads and then here's a similar or another example say we flip the coin a ton of times but the probability of landing on heads is fairly small so because it's small that means that the likelihood that we're only going to see it let's say once or even zero times is fairly high and then the likelihood we're going to see it maybe once is also pretty high and twice like fairly high but the likelihood that we're going to see it any more than just a couple times is low because again the probability that we land on that is p and um you know we have a ton of coin tosses so um yeah hopefully that makes sense this is my this is me tossing a coin yeah okay um i don't know if you saw that anyways we're going to go over another example um, error correcting codes if you recall from I don't even know what note um, there was this scenario where we wanted to send a message of length n but k packets um, would be lost so we would send n plus k packets so if k were lost we would still be able to construct I guess it was our polynomial that would allow us to find the message but anyways we're going to treat the probability that we lose a packet as p, and that probability is you know independent of each packet. So we can look at the um, number of packets received and treat that as a random variable x, and we can actually model it as a binomial distribution, um, which is equivalent to saying we're going to toss n plus k coins, and then each coin has a probability of landing on heads as one minus p. Because remember, packet loss is defined as p. If the packet goes through, that's just going to be one minus p. So yeah, so we can essentially just set up the binomial distribution equation with the appropriate values. And if we um, have n packets that we need to send through, and we know the probability that the packet is going to get lost, then using this binomial distribution, we can find which k will maximize our probability that the message goes through. So in essence, how many pack, how many additional packages will we have to add so that um, we have the highest likelihood of being able to uh, reconstruct you know the original message given all the packets that we receive. So hopefully that makes sense. And now we're going to move on to the um, hypergeometric distribution. So um, to start off simply, we have a box. There's black balls in it, and there's white balls in it. In total, there are n balls. x is going to be the number of black balls that you see in a sample. And we want to know what is the probability of x, given that we sample some value of balls less than the total number of balls without replacement. So we take it out and we don't put it back in. So it basically comes out to this. So assuming that you pick k black balls, um, that means that we pick n minus k white balls, it would kind of be like this. So the first time around, there are b black balls and there's n total balls. So you know we just have a b over n chance of grabbing that um, black ball and then once we grab that black ball we have a b minus we have b minus one black balls and n minus one total balls and so that becomes our new probability for that second draw and this continues on um, until we have reached this value right here we have drawn um, a total of k black balls and now we sort of just continue this on until we reach the end of our sample, the sample that we're taking out of the set of all balls. And remember that that is this lowercase n. And yeah, we would calculate because 
because we picked k balls, now we have to pick um, n minus k white balls, essentially. And so just simplifying this down, we get this formula right here. And um, let's see, something interesting about this is that the numerator stays the same regardless of k, but the denominator always the same. I think I think it was the numerator changes. Honestly, I don't remember. Let me just look at the notes really quick. Right, so the numerator can change if k changes, but the nominate the denominators will always be the same because we will always go from n to n minus n plus one, uh, because again, that's how many balls we're drawing out. We're drawing n balls. Um, it's just that there might be fewer, might be taking fewer black balls and more k or more white balls, um, and it could be the other way around as well. So let's see, there are n choose k ways to pick k black balls, and um, then we have our distribution, which simplifies out to this. And yep, that's kind of what it would look like. So the important things we would have to pass in are the total number of balls, the total number of black balls, and then the size of our sample. Okay, so now we're going to move on to multiple random variables and independence. So can you have many random variables? Well, let's see. Um, we can define x as the second coin toss is tails, y is the first coin toss is heads, z is the number of tails. Um, each has their own distribution. So let's see. For a particular sample point, you know, heads, tails, tails, given that n is equal to three. Um, second coin toss is tails. And if this is just a Bernoulli distribution, then it's just zero or one, true or false, essentially. So, this would just be true, first coin is heads, true, number of tails, two. Um, yeah, you can have several random variables. Um, again, depending on the sample points, these values are going to be different, so that's why they're random variables. Um, let's see, we're gonna talk about joint distribution and we're gonna define it as, um, so for two discrete random variables, x and y, in the collection of values. Um, so the joint, let, okay, let me just read it. The joint distribution for two discrete random variables, x and y, is the collection of values a comma b, such that the probability of x is equal to a, the probability of y is equal to b, for all um, a in set of a values and b in the set of b values. Um, yeah. So this comma, what is that? So let's see, marginal distribution of X. So say our vent equal to X, joint distribution, and we're gonna pass in some value A um, the sum of all of the range points for y, um, if we take that probability, and then we also look at the probability that x is equal to a, and then we sum that for all of these b's, then we're gonna get the total probability of, of a. So essentially, we're gonna fix the probability of a, and we're gonna look at that probability of a with respect to each individual probability in B. So let's see, the same idea goes for you know, a bunch of random variables um, and then the probabilities of each of those. So let's see, um, we're gonna talk about independence with respect to random variables. So random variables X and Y on the same probability space are said to be independent if the events x is equal to a and y is equal to b are independent for all values of a and b. And equivalently, equivalently the joint distribution of independent random variables decomposes as the following. 
I'm almost certain I just like ripped this straight from the notes, so I'm gonna put that in quotes. But yeah, basically if they're independent, then we can just multiply their probabilities together. And this must be the case, you know, for all A's and B's. Um, mutual independence. Um, yeah, if there's a whole bunch of random variables, maybe say x1 through xn, and they're all mutually independent, we can just sort of, if we want to find the probabilities of x1 on a1, x2 on a2, and so on, we can just multiply all those probabilities together. Um, let's see, independent and identically distributed set of random variables, um, that's going to be i. Um, so in a simple terms, say we have four coin tosses, um, the event i, um, capital I sub uh, zero, or let's say capital I sub one is the, the event such that the first coin toss is ahead. Capital I sub two is the event such that the second coin toss is head, and so on. And these are called indicator events. We sort of brought that up earlier when we said that um, the sum of all of the indicator events is equal to, um, not what I meant to do. The sum of all the indicator, the probabilities of the indicator events is just equal to one. And all of these events are mutually independent. So let's look, uh, I think this is analogous to this. So, you know, probability, like each of these, these numbers right here, is kind of like its own event. You know, event that we have zero heads, the event that we have one head, the two heads. All of these sample points are confined to just like zero heads or one head or two heads. So notice how they're all independent of each other. So like if we wanted to find the probability given four coin tosses that we have one head or that we have two heads, um, yeah, we could simply just add those together and that would be that. Okay. Now let's go back down here. Okay, so let's talk about expectation a little bit. Um, so let's see. The homework, we're going to talk about the homework example. Yeah, so again, the total number of permutations was n factorial and if, if, if n is equal to 20, then there's approximately this many sample points. And we want to be able to summarize this distribution by finding the the average of the random variables, of the, of the random variable. Okay, so let's see. Um, basically, expectation, which I sort of brought, it was referenced at the very beginning. Given this example, once again, um, we would expect to have two heads if we flip the coin four times. That's basically what expectation is. So the expectation, the average, the mean is going to be for each, um, let's see, number in the range of our random variable. We're just gonna take that and multiply it by the probability that we obtain that value. So it's sort of hard to talk about generally, but it's easier once we look at an example. So again, this is the fixed points example. Um, our expected value in this case is going to be one. So first point, you can have zero fixed points. Probability of obtaining zero fixed points is one over three. We just add that to, if we have one fixed point, probability of us you know, obtaining a sample with one fixed point is one half because again, half of them, half of them, three out of the six, have one fixed point. Okay. Um, yeah, same goes for here, and then we just sort of add it up, and you can basically expect to see one fixed point, right? Because in this case, half of the sample points have one fixed one fixed point, so you would expect to 
obtain a sample with one fixed point. Um, and okay, another thing is that the expected value does not need to be a value that the random variable can take on. Um, I think a good example is this case right that we were talking about earlier. I believe the expected value would probably be like 4.5 for this. But again, that's not something we can actually take on. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's what it's referring to. OK. So what is the expected value? Um, it would, in this visual example, it's the balance point between like all of the, the data, essentially. Um, if it, if there's more on one side, and this is heavier. Let's say this side is longer, and there's less. Well, then the real balance point would be somewhere like right here. That's how you can sort of feel it, I guess. So one example that I came up with, actually, I did not come up with. My friend Shane Irwin told me this in like third grade, I think, at recess. I don't know how he knew this. But OK, so let's say you're guessing on a multiple choice question, and there's four options. You have a 1 fourth chance of getting any particular option right. And if we say the options are A, B, C, and D, or the values 1, 2, 3, and 4, if we uh, just plug it into the expectation formula, we can see that we can expect to get a value of 2.5 which rounds to C. So basically, if you need to guess, the probability that you land, or the probability that the question, the expected value is C. That's what that's saying. Expected value is C. So pick C if you're going to guess. OK. This is pretty much the same idea as you know, if we were to throw one dice, what would be the expected value of that? Well, a dice can take on any of these values here. These are any of the A's that the event can take on, or the random variable can take on. And then this is the probability um, with respect to each A. You know, we have a 1 6 chance of landing on 1, same for 2, same for 3, and so on. So what happens if we throw two dice? Well, you can sort of create a 2 by 2 grid to map this out. Um, you know, 1 through 6 on the x-axis, 1 through 6 on the y-axis and see kind of like what the, the outcomes are. Um, these are all the possible outcomes. These are all the possible A's. Here are the probabilities of each of the A's. Um, turns out there's 36 permutations. Yeah, six to the two. And um, we can calculate, calculate the expected value by taking the probability of a particular outcome and then multiplying it by that outcome. And then you can see that the expected value is going to be seven and that kind of makes sense because this is a, this looks, it's like a bell curve kind of, yeah. Bernoulli distribution maybe? Not Bernoulli, binomial. But anyways, like seven is that sweet spot because there's like a bunch of numbers that can add up to um, seven, like one and six, two and five, three and four. So has the highest outcome. Another example we're gonna talk about is a roulette wheel. So um, a roulette wheel has 38 slots. 18 of them are red, 18 of them are black, and two of them are green. So you bet $1 on the ball landing on black. And if you win, you gain a you gain dollar. And if you lose, then you lose a dollar. So the let's see the probability that um, I guess we're just modeling the prob the event that we or I guess the indicator event that we get a dollar and then the event that we lose a dollar that's that so if we're betting on red we have a 18 out of 38 chance of winning betting if we lose considering that we bet on red, then we have a 20 out of 38 chance of losing. And so just multiplying these together, you can see that our expected value 
is negative 1 over 19. So again, because this is modeling how much we earn, we're expected to lose about a 20th of a dollar or a nickel each game. Okay, now we're going to talk about something called the line linearity expectation or just linearity expectation. Yeah. So something neat about this is for any events x and y in the same probability space, we take the ex expectation of x and y, and that's the same as the expectation of x plus the expectation of y. And then we can also take constants and move them out. But, okay, I guess here is the proof. So if we just take the regular expectation formula, like so, and we kind of just substitute in what this A is, um, which is, we can notice that these are actually like the same size. So this is saying for all sample points, we're going to run the sample point through our random variable and we're going to multiply it by you know the probability of that sample point. Um, notice how this is like this is essentially the same thing because we're summing up all of the individual sample points or we can decide to group each of the sample points into their respective um, their respective A's essentially um, and then calculate the probabilities from there but it's, it's really like the same idea and I'm, I'm saying A because A can really be anything I feel like so what would you call that like each respective indicator event right hopefully that's hopefully these words are making some sense so then if we were to sum two events together take the expectation of that um, it would pretty much be the same as if we were to take the, you know, let's see. If we just replace x with x plus y here, you know, that's what we would do. Um, so, and then we can distribute, like, each sample point goes out to each event. And then we can just distribute the probability and the sum. And then we see that it's really just equal to the expectation of each individual event. So something we want to be careful of is this example works right here. Um, we can apply the expectation to each individual event and then we can take out the constant but we can't, you know, if two events are multiplied by each other we can't take them out like this and then this also does not work. So now we're going to look at some of the applications of linearity, of the linearity of expectation and those are sort of going to go back to what we talked about previously, some of those examples. So um, the two dice example is basically if yi is the score of die, um, die i and we have two dies, then we can simply sum up the expectations of the two dies, um, which gives us seven, which you know is exactly what we wanted earlier. Um, the expectation of one die is just seven over two that was the one over six times, you know, one plus two plus three all the way through six. Um, let's see, if we play the roulette game, um, if we play the game n times, then, you know, what is the expectation on, like, so basically if we play the game n times, like what is the probability that we win on the first time? or the second time, or the third time, all the way through the nth time. So we can just distribute the expectation out like so. And it's basically going to be a 1 over 19, or 1 19th loss n times. So you would lose about $53 if you played 1,000 times and you bet $1 each time. So fixed points of permutations. Um, X sub N is going to be the number of students who receive their own homework after shuffling. So we're going to have these indicator variables where indicator variable one, or so sorry, capital I sub one is the event that student one receives their homework. Capital I sub two is the event that student two receives their homework. Right, so um, the expectation just using the formula again, is the 
um, value that they don't. So if they don't get their homework, it's just a zero. If they do get their homework, it's a one. We can just take the probabilities of you know the students just getting their homework and that's basically just going to be equal to the expectation of i just sort of as we've demonstrated here and what this is saying is the is is like what is the probability that student i gets their own homework and um, if we think about it it's just one over n so again there's n homeworks um, we're just looking at one student any number of those n homeworks can be given back to that one student so there's just a one over n chance that they receive their homework. Um, the expectation that um, the student, or the, the, so the expectation of the event of the student receiving their homework or not receiving their homework is just equal to the probability that the student gets their homework, given that this is one nth, and we're doing this for all students, it's just going to be n times n, which is equal to one. So what we are essentially saying is that we expect the number of fixed points to be one. And that sort of checks out with the example that we looked at earlier. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's this. This has the highest likelihood right here. Um, okay, coin tosses. So, let's see. We're going to toss a fair coin n greater than or equal to one times. So, each of these indicator events is the event that the one coin is heads, the event that the second coin is heads, so on. Or, I mean, not one first. First is the right word. Okay. So, let's see. By a similar logic, the expected value um, of a particular indicator um, random variable is the same, you know, as we sort of defined up here, which is saying what is the probability that the i toss is head, so it's just 1 over 2. And given that we do it n times, uh, we get n over 2. And we can just simplify this as n times the probability of landing on heads, or not simplify, but generalize. And then for biased coins, yeah. So this is the generalization for biased coins. Okay, um, let's see. So again, balls and bins. We're going to throw m balls into n bins, and we're going to let x be the random variable. Um, um, that is the number of balls that land in the first bin. So the expected value is m over n. So let's say we have four balls and n bins um, or I mean, let's let's pick something a bit more round so we have two bins four balls we just randomly distribute all of the balls amongst the bins because there is a you know one half chance that any ball lands in any bin it would make sense that there is four over two balls in the first bin or just two balls in the first bin Okay, um, so all of these are basically the probability, uh, or let's see. So, okay, we're going to define event random, or rand we're going to define random variable y sub n as the, um, the number of empty bins. And that's sort of hard to conceptualize, but if we break it down into like the sum of the indicator events, where we're going to say, you know, the ind indicator event at one is just the probability that bin one is empty, right? So what that essentially is, is, so we have a one over n chance of a ball going into our bin, right? That means we have a one minus one over n chance of the ball not going into our bin. We're going to apply this m times for each ball, and that's going to give us the probability that the ith bin is empty. Okay, so, yep, we can essentially do this. So that checks out. And 
there's pretty there's like a relationship um, with the number e. Um, so anyways, yeah e. So it's like this, and what this is saying is that given a thousand balls and a thousand bins, we can expect about three hundred and sixty-eight of those bins to be empty. Okay. So that was a lot. Hopefully you got a good understanding of like the definition of random variables and what distribution is and what expectation is. Um, but other than that, yep, that has been the 15th note for CS70. This has been all about stuff that I just said.